All right, skin. Easily the thing you'll treat the most of in practice will be skin, pyodermas, skin and ears, okay. It's uh, really nearly always targeted at staph pseudo-intermedius. Used to be called staph intermedius, now it's pseudo-intermedius. Um, bacteriologists just love to rename things. Their organism won't change, but their, their names do. Uh, so that's pseudo intermediates. Uh, I really like first generation cephalosporins here, like cephalexin, keflex. That's probably my first choice. It's cheap and it has a good probability of uh, susceptibility. Other things you'll see used as first choices uh, cephalopodoxime is simpliceph. Uh, <coughs> used for skin, labeled for skin. I prefer to save it for uh, more resistant infections, so I tend to use uh, cephalexin first, and then I'll go to cephadoxine based on culture and sensitivity, but it wouldn't be wrong if you did. Likewise, clindamycin is effective, as is clavamox. TMS is actually quite effective. Uh, again, we've just got all the side effects that we have to be aware of if we use TMS. So uh, we don't use TMS like we once did, but it's really pretty expensive if you uh, get away from the monitoring aspect. Uh, <clears throat> how long? There's no scientific evidence to tell us, really. We usually go three weeks on a first-time pyoderma. Uh, and six to eight weeks on a chronic or a deep pyoderma. Now, you use clinical judgment. There are times where I'll go for a shorter duration, seven to 10 days, if it's not really bad. But that's, that's your decision as a clinician, okay? Uh, <coughs> so, uh, uh, three weeks on a first time. Uh, let me contrast this. I'm, when I say pyoderma, I am not talking about a hot spot. A hot spot uh, is acute moist dermatitis. You all know what it looks like. Red, raw, uh, really pruritic evidently because the dogs are scratching and biting and making it bleed and utterly miserable. Antibiotics play a relatively uh, minor role in managing hot spots. Mostly there you want to clean. Uh, the area, clip it so it's ventilated real well, and dry it out. So I really like astringents. I'll talk about those. Uh, so Dumboros is an aluminum sulfate uh, solution that dries the skin. So usually clipping it in astringent and a steroid for two or three days to break the self-trauma is all I need. I rarely would put uh, a dog with a hot spot on antibiotics, truthfully. Malesthesia of the skin, yeast infection. Uh, uh, most of these, well, at least 50% have Cushing's. There's some sort of immunosuppression going on. Not always, but anytime you get a yeast of the skin, not the ears, the ears that can occur otherwise, usually that's allergies. But if it's the actual uh, skin uh, yeast infection, then look for some degree of immunosuppression. And azoles are what we typically use. Um, usually, did I skip a slide? Uh, the, You'll use some sort of azole systemically as well. Most commonly, this is ketoconazole. Any of the azoles would work, but ketoconazole is our cheapest. So uh, we, we oftentimes use that to control it in addition to the topical. So usually systemic and topical. All right, wound care. All right. Uh, you're gonna see a lot of wounds, dog bite wounds, hit by cars, all sorts of things. Hit by tractor, um, we, we see a little bit of everything. The first thing in any wound is to clean it. 
All right, uh, so this is kind of how I, I go about it. First thing you do is you put sterile lube into the actual wound itself. And that's because the next step is to clip it. All right, so you, the sterile lube keeps the hair from getting down into the wound. So you apply the KY jelly into the wound and then you clip the hair around it to get it good and exposed. Uh, then you start cleaning it. Okay, and the skin, you, we can use scrub solutions, that sort of thing. You have to be cautious with the wound itself. Most soaps are going to irritate the wound, so we usually don't put scrub directly into a wound. Instead, we're going to lavage with solutions. And sterile saline is hard to beat in this regard, just volume. You can take a, uh, uh, a liter bag of sterile saline, put an IV line on, hook a three-way stopcock on the end and hook a 60cc syringe with an 18 gauge needle on it and you just use the stopcock to, to fill the syringe. And if you take that 60 and you just squeeze as hard as you can, that jet of uh, saline coming out is about the right pressure to really allow you to clean that wound really nicely. And you just keep doing that over and over until you uh, get the wound lavaged uh, like you you uh, you want it. The um, <clears throat> if it's a really big wound, and this applies more to large animal. Here's a little recipe for you on how to make uh, isotonic saline for lavaging a wound. Now, it won't be sterile, but you can take a gallon bucket of water. Uh, add about five teaspoons of salt to it. If you've got a syringe instead of a teaspoon, just measure out 25 cc's, and that will be roughly isotonic. And you can use that, just pour that in mass over the wound. The big thing is not so much sterility in lavaging this is as volume, just to get the wound clean, get out all the debris, the grass, the dirt, the rocks. It's uh, getting it clean, and we worry about the sterility of the solution secondarily. In a, in a horse or a cow, if I had, uh, and it's a big old wound where they ran into the front end loader or something like that, it's a big old wound. If I had the choice between a liter of saline and five gallons of plain water, I'd take the five gallons of plain water just for the volume. So I'll use the water hose on those uh, situations if necessary. But you can do this really cheaply and still have it isotonic where you don't uh, injure uh, the exposed tissue. Uh, do we use topicals? Here, here's a debate that I'm sure the surgeons will be talking to you about. Historically, we always did it. Now, not so much. If it's a really good, clean wound, uh, then sterile saline may be all you really need. All right. But if it's more contaminated, I tend to follow up uh, with antiseptics, and oftentimes in that lavage solution. I mentioned in the antiseptic, I used the 1 to 40 chlorhexidine very commonly in this solution uh, in wounds. But a lot of things are applied topically. Uh, you'll have chlorhexidine, again, novacin for wounds, uh, povidone iodine, which is betadine, modified Dakins or Vitericin. Uh, Vitericin, uh, I mentioned on the slide, I wrote it on the slide, but I didn't talk about it. It's on the modified Dakin solution slide. Vitericin is a commercial product that's roughly equivalent to a modified Dakin's. Okay, it's more shelf stable and they claim uh, um, a little less irritating than the modified Dakin's. You don't have the volume that you would use if you made your own, but that's what the Tiercin is. Uh, silver sulfidizing, and interestingly, uh, you'll see, and there is data to support the use either of honey or sugar in wounds. More, we use this not in the acute wound, but uh, in the infected wound or the more chronic wound to, to promote healing, okay? And honey, uh, both of these are very hypertonic. You'd think bacteria would just grow like crazy in sugar, but they're so hypertonic they actually have a bacteriostatic effect. So uh, you'll see clinicians apply honey to wounds, 
or a common thing is they'll take table sugar and they'll pour betadine solution into the table sugar and make kind of a slurry and apply that to the wound. So all of these things, antiseptics, like I say, more in the infected wound than the clean wound though. Uh, clean wounds, uh, we oftentimes don't use antiseptics or uh, antibiotics. Uh, specifically bite wounds, uh, these are infected with just about everything. When they've cultured them, 90% of them culture positive and they're gram positive, they're gram negative, and they're obligate anaerobes. Only about 15 to 20% though will go on to be infected, but we need to address that 20%. Again, time until uh, you see them to lavage and clean the wound is the biggest predictor. The longer any wound goes without being properly cleaned, the more likely it is to become infected. All right, and we use uh, four quadrant, but again, we don't go big gun typically for this sort of thing. Uh, unison or clavamox, depending on if you want injection or oral. It's where we start with, and then we'll adjust antibiotics later on if a uh, resistant infection comes in. I want to mention about um, moist dermatitis, not hot spot, but um, <clears throat> this is a picture of um, one of my own dogs. She was a rescue cocker spaniel, and she had um, bad ear infections. Duh, guess what, yeah. <laughs> my, my, unfortunately, my wife loves Cocker Spaniels. I, I keep trying to talk her out <laughs> of getting another. Right now, we don't have one. We have uh, two other rescues. But this was one that we got from Birmingham as a rescue, and uh, the veterinarian that had, was working with the rescue group opted to do a bilateral canal um, uh, resection. Uh, this is where, remember the, the ear canal on a dog is not like a human. In a human it, it's straight in. In a dog it goes down and then turns. And what, one of the things that's common in this to uh, manage otitis is to do a lateral wall resection, which is where you cut out that lateral wall and basically create a straight tunnel just like a human has. If you get to them early enough, it, it does help. You go too long, you have to do an ablation. But that's what they did here. And that was wonderful. I think it was appropriate. What was not good was after they did this, they took her ears and they coated them in Panalog. And Panalog is, uh, let me see, it's um, um, uh, Nystatin, dexamethasone and, and neomycin, I believe. It's a three-way. It's, it's an aminoglycoside steroid um, combination. All right. And uh, then they applied uh, telfil pads over that and then wrapped it all up in gauze. And the, the idea was to prevent infection. But what they were doing is by occluding it, they were creating a moist environment that promoted re organisms resistant to this. And this grew a very resistant enterococcus. And when we first got her back, <clears throat> I took all that off. There was, uh, she was sloughing the edges of her skin, but eventually this whole area sloughed out. And what you're looking at right here is cartilage, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so we had to go in uh, we put her on chloramphenicol for the enterococcus infection and, and surgery went in and actually cut out that diseased cartilage and sewed her edges back together so she had a little kink in that ear uh, afterwards, but it did heal. Now, that whole story was uh, to get to uh, some phraseology that is really helpful in Durham. Uh, when I went through, I was told this is the most, uh, best advice I got from this dermatologist. And he, he was a derm guru. Uh, we, had to, we were responsible, I think, for 250 diseases of the skin when he taught us, uh, which was a little ridiculous, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> but he, he said, uh, when it comes to skin, if it's dry, wet it, 
if it's wet, dry it out. All right. So, so moist skin promotes infection typically. You don't want to keep it occluded. So never occlude skin with ointments. Uh, they usually need to be uh, exposed to air and drying and use appropriate uh, wound care. Frequent cleaning, lavage, wet to dry bandaging if, it, if it's exudative, uh, no bandaging or dry to dry if it's non-exudative for, uh, for wounds. And again, here are some of the uh, uh, topicals that if it's infected, we'll use. But these are not really occlusive per se. All right, so any questions on wound care, bite wounds, that sort of thing. All right, I think I can get through this next slide. Cellulitis. Cellulitis just means soft tissue infection. Uh, it's kind of a blanket term for any uh, tissue other than one of the, the, so it's not skin, it's deeper, it's sub-Q, it's muscle, this sort of thing. Now, itis normally means inflammation, but cellulitis always implies infection. So it's an infection of the soft tissue. And uh, it can be virtually any organism, and it can run the gamut. It can be very mild, which is what we usually see, just a little inflammation around a lesion, to necrotizing. All right, and, and it depends on what you're dealing with. Uh, a lot of these start through skin penetration, so staph is always a consideration, but it can be anything. Uh, this, uh, and because it can be anything, we, uh, if it warrants treatment, then four quadrant coverage is usually necessary. Now, this picture, I don't know that you can appreciate this. Uh, this skin on a greyhound was white normally. It is now purple. That's because the entire leg is dead. Okay. This started as a little fingernail size lesion on the thigh when Layrack found it in the blood donor about 7.30 that morning. And this is at 8 o'clock that night. Actually, that's at 5 p.m. Uh, when I took that before I left. They had to euthanize the dog at 8 o'clock. All right. So in a 12-hour time frame, it went from a little bitty lesion to the whole leg being necrotic. This is what's called necrotizing fasciitis or flesh-eating bacteria. Okay. And uh, I hope you never see this. I've seen it twice in 35 years. Uh, so the odds are good that you won't, but here's the take-home message on this. Necrotizing fasciitis is a surgical emergency, not an antibiotic emergency. Yes, we use antibiotics, but it's surgical debridement of the infected area and beyond the infected area that is paramount. All right. We think the problem, uh, and this turned out to be an E. coli. They put it on clindamycin in Batril. It was resistant to the Batril. Uh, so, wrong choice again. But we think that the bacteria are producing toxins that kill the blood supply in advance of its uh, replication. So the antibiotics really don't reach the bacteria very well. So that's why it's key that you debride this. So in this case, the only way we would have saved this dog would be to have amputated the leg earlier in the day before it got up into that pelvic region. Uh, if it's not an area to amputate, you need to be aggressive, uh, cut out not only the dead tissue, but into the living tissue uh, to make sure you're not leaving anything behind. So necrotizing fasciitis requires antibiotics, but it is a surgical emergency. The, the second one of these I saw, and I'll quit, it came in a referral. Basically, it was again a rear leg. The, I, you could visualize the Achilles tendon. There was no skin over it anymore. Uh, and the animal was very sick. Uh, and I told the surgeons, I said, you better amputate the leg or, or this animal is going to die. And they said, oh, it's hypotensive, it's septic, it's a poor anesthetic risk, we're going to use antibiotics. It died in about six hours. Yes, it, they are poor anesthetic risks because of this, but if you don't do it, they will die. 
Okay, any questions on any? All right, that's it.